hubris leads to nemesis. Overconfidence, excessive pride, arrogance, whatever you want to call it, is often excused as a personality trait that gifts the other person with the ability to get things done, lead the way, or to make deals. And this is often true. But as Ingrid Rossellini remarks in an article on ego and impulse, when politicians claim to be making a decision from their gut, history tells us that we should be highly sceptical. Overreaching, especially when in the public eye, what the Greeks called hubris, leads to the downfall not just of the self, but of the community. In ancient Athens, Socrates warned against sophists who didn't believe in anything but personal gain, and were well versed in the ability to twist an argument to suit their needs. When personal gain is stretched too far though, at the expense of the community, hubris sets in, and a hubris can only be met with nemesis, the fool. The ancient Greeks, whose democracy lasted for 200 years, were especially wary of hubris, which was seen to be punished by the goddess of retribution, Nemesis. Leaders in particular are often accused of hubristic behaviour. Ian Kershaw titled his two-part biography of Hitler, Hubris and Nemesis. And Napoleon, Alexander the Great, and the Roman Empire's downfalls and declines have been described as hubristic. One of the earliest references to hubris, or hybris, occurs in Homer's Odyssey, written in the 8th century BC and arguably, along with the Iliad, the oldest and first examples of Western literature. In Homer's Odyssey, the suitors of Penelope feast and drink excessively, leading Athena to remark that they seem to be feasting Hybrizontis. After that, the word becomes increasingly common in Greek literature and politics. For Herodotus, hubris was also used to describe a group of men accosting girls lecherously. And in the plays of Aeschylus, hubris is used to describe excessive lust. In Sophocles' story, King Creon accuses Antigone of hubris when she buries her brother, Polynices, against the king's wishes. So a broad Greek definition of hubris is personal excess and self-indulgence in contrast to rational self-control or morality. In fact, it was so important to the Athenians that it was written into Athenian law. If anyone high breezy against anyone, either child or woman or man, free or slave, or does anything illegal against any of these, let anyone who wishes of these Athenians, who are entitled, to prosecute him before the Thesmothetai. What's interesting though, as Douglas M. McDowell has noted, is that hubris is not defined. It is taken for granted that everyone knows what it means, that it's in the common usage and regarded as important. The trial of Medias provides us with an insight into how the Athenians thought of both hubris and democracy. In 348 BC, Medias, a wealthy Athenian, punched Demosthenes in the theatre of Dionysus. Demosthenes brought charges upon Medias, claiming this was a public assault against a public figure, and therefore an assault on democracy itself, an act of hubris. Demosthenes claimed that Medias was an anti-democratic, elitist figure, using his vast power against a humble public servant. He tells the jury, We are indeed both elite and both powerful, but I am a defender of the democracy, while he hopes to destroy it. Medias is powerful because of wealth. Demosthenes is powerful only because the demos backs him. Demosthenes claims that rich aristocrats like Medias want to force their hierarchical approach to the world into Athenian democracy. Only the collective is strong enough to withstand this moral attack. In a rousing speech that is worth quoting at length, Demosthenes asks, 
And what is the power of the laws? Is it that if any of you is attacked and gives a shout, that they will come running to your aid? No, they are just inscribed letters and have no ability to do that. What then is their motive power? You are, if you secure them and make them authoritative, whenever anyone asks for aid. So the laws are powerful through you and you through the laws. You must therefore stand up for them in just the same way as any individual would stand up for himself if attacked. You must take the view that offences against the law are common concerns. We don't know much about the outcome of the trial, but Demosthenes either won the case or received an out-of-court settlement. What's most interesting about Greek hubris is that it's a common misconception that hubris results in punishment from the gods. While this is true in some cases, the truth is much more powerful. Hubris is much more commonly referred to as the risk of the destruction of the community, the fool of the polis, arrogance that is punished by others. Nemesis then doesn't come from the gods, but the people. Because for the Greeks the polis is an inherent part of man, as Demosthenes' speech illustrates, a man's descent into hubris leads him to madness. Man cannot live without the balance of the community. Hubris may be summed up as delusions of grandeur that can lead to madness. Like Icarus, whose father warned him not to fly too close to the sun, but who ignored his advice, melted his wings and fell to his death. Or Apollo's son, Phaeton, who pleaded with his father to let him fly the chariot that dragged the sun across the sky. Apollo, after much resistance, obliged, but Phaeton was too young and inexperienced and scorched the earth by losing control of the chariot. Zeus had to strike Phaeton with a thunderbolt to avert disaster. These ancient myths warn against hubris, but they aren't just myths. The psychologist Wilfred Owen believes that hubris is actually a syndrome, a personality disorder exhibited in leaders with qualities like charisma and self-confidence that begin to display an antithesis with symptoms like impetuosity, a refusal to listen, impulsivity, recklessness or a contempt for others. Owen argues that Richard Nixon, Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair, among others, all succumbed to hubris. Owen also claims that dictators are particularly prone to hubris because there are less constraints on their behaviour. Athenian democracy lasted for around 200 years, about as long as our Western democracies, and many of their myths, philosophies and language have shaped the modern world, lasting to this day. So taking note of what the Greeks put emphasis on and lamenting over what led to their decline is probably something that should guide our own understanding of politics today. If you want to support Then and Now, then please subscribe below and most importantly, click the bell here to receive notifications when I upload a new video. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram in the links in the description below. And if you're feeling really generous, then this channel only exists through the support of pledges on Patreon, where you can support new content with as little as a dollar for each new video. Thanks for watching. See you next week.